thank you all for coming, and I, I'm, I'm so thrilled uh, at, the, at the turnout and delighted. I know why you're here, obviously, uh, the, the, the much, much beloved, and, and we'll, we'll get into that. But, but first, let me, let me welcome you and say that I am Dennis Scully. I am the host of the Business of Home podcast, and I'm also the curator of the Dialogues on Design series here at NYSID, and we are thrilled to be celebrating our second in-person dialogues uh, this year, so we're, so we're thrilled and it's so great to have everyone here. Just so that you know, this program is all about raising money for our scholarship programs, and so again, I thank you for that. Through subscriptions and sponsorships, these conversations raise money for a variety of scholarships that we offer here at the school including our diversity scholarship and our pre-college scholarship program, where we're hoping to introduce interior design to young people, often from underrepresented communities. And I'm grateful to everyone who has helped to make this event possible, and I wanna give special thanks to Holly Hunt, Kathy Doyle, Andrea Fonstock, Ellen Kravit, Kravit Inc., Peter Penoyer, Cynthia Murphy, and Gil Schaefer. Can we just give them a, a quick round of applause. Their generosity is greatly appreciated by the school and by the students. And with all of that out of the way, I have the great pleasure tonight of speaking with the award-winning landscape architect. Now I'm about to embarrass her now because I'm gonna really pile it on. Uh, so go ahead, go ahead, right? Yeah, yeah. So in addition to multiple Stanford White Awards, Mul multiple Stanford White Awards for garden design, and numerous, too numerous to mention, professional merit awards. This year, she became the first landscape architect ever to receive the Design Leadership Award, and uh, that was a pretty big deal, yes? Thank you. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm told that Jamie Drake doesn't actually even like to go outside <laughs> unless Janice has designed the exterior. <laughs> So uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled to, to have uh, Jan Janice Parker with, with us to, tonight. So welcome. Yes. Thank you. And our, our hope was that we were going to make everyone in this room, by the end of the night, say, why aren't I a landscape architect? I totally want to become like Janice Parker. Janice Parker will make you want to become a landscape architect or you'll just want to spend a lot more time with Janice Parker, either, <laughs> either way. But I feel like so many people in the room might not even really know what we mean, particularly some of our students. What are we, what are we talking about when we're talking about landscape architecture? It sounds very fancy, very grand, but, but what is it really all about? Well, you're not alone. I think most people are very confused as to what a landscape designer and a landscape architect is and what is the difference. And um, basically, I think it's similar to a therapist and a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know so are you I mean? a little bit of both? Yes, and you okay. can't really have one without the other. You need the therapist that can spend time with you and they can, they can really get involved in a lot of the um, the maintenance of your brain and, and your life, and a landscape architect might write you a prescription. Do you know what I mean? And be sort of the, the bigger um, technical and engineering advice you might bring in, the permitting advice you might bring in, the overall understanding of um, the way that certain structural and, and horticultural things might work. I've been both. And um, I loved being a landscape designer, and I have been doing as something with nature or flowers my entire life. And I loved, loved the hands-on. As a matter of fact, last week, I was doing a small garden out in Arizona and placing every plant, and I think that's the first time I've been truly happy in months. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, there's just nothing like spending time with plants, and it's just fantastic. However, as life goes on and jobs get bigger and um, you know, I, I decided to sit for my national board exams and become a licensed landscape architect so I could stamp plans and, and have the full credibility and understanding there are five national exams and there's a lot to it um, that, that 
really doesn't touch on plants at all. So, you know, I think people need to really, in a program for landscape architecture, I don't think you get more than six months or a year um, out of a four-year program. But it's, um, it's, it's still an incredible program to study. And the profession itself has a little bit of trouble knowing what it is. You know, um, and I feel that when there are times of natural disasters and, and hurricanes and, and floods, you know, that that's when our profession should be standing up and being counted. And certainly um, in a lot of um, projects that have to do with, um, you know, basically environmental justice, economic justice, and, and really working with uh, brownfields and abandoned sites and underprivileged neighborhoods, it's such a crucial thing to know how to do all of that kind of planning, permitting, and creating. Um, and uh, so I decided I wanted to do that. I was very interested in the interstitial spaces, the green spaces that were left in New York City in, in neighborhoods. And when I was interested in it, Manhattan looked awful, right? It was still awful. Manhattan looks pretty good right now, so I think you know, a lot's been accomplished. But the outer boroughs do not. And um, to be able to work in that world, you do need that credential. Boy, did I wait too long. I mean, <laughs> oh my God, it was torture. Torture, torture taking those tests. And I'm, don't ask me how many times I failed the engineering one, because I'm not telling you. <laughs> well, and, and Don't we judge me, just don't judge <laughs> me on that. <laughs> well, and, and, and we should say, I mean, that you really studied yourself to take all of those. I mean, you decided to go a, a, a different Route. A different route, right. right? I didn't have the schooling, you know, and so I went, I had to uh, go to the cap, to the um, capital um, and, um, and make my appeal to the licensing board that they allow me to sit for them because I didn't have any of the credentials or the education for it. Um, but I did have the work and I had the commendations from other professionals and I was teaching landscape architects. And I had landscape architects working for me. But it's very similar to you, you, if you have a medical clinic, you have to be a licensed doctor. You can't just hire doctors to work for you. And it's the same thing. I could have landscape architects working for me, but I needed to be credentialed to be a landscape architecture firm. Um, and, um, and then once I told my entire staff I was doing it, and I started <laughs> doing it, which I thought would be simple, which it wasn't, then what could I do? Just say, no, I give up? I mean, I was stuck. <laughs> I was just absolutely stuck. And, um, and I was stuck till I passed them all, you know? And it was a good experience. It was a very good experience. And everyone in my firm is either licensed or on the, on the path to licensure. I support that. Um, and I support the, the fees and the tutoring and whatever it takes, because I think it's an important part of a toolkit to try your hands at everything. I mean, ultimately, to me, if we're talking about design, mm. design is training. It's just training, 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 training all the time, no matter where you are, what you're doing. I was out in Portland, and I visited the Portland Japanese Garden, which is, if you ever go, it's one of the most extraordinary gardens created by the Japanese after World War II um, and after all of the uh, horrible you know, problems that happened with the internment camps, and it was a gesture of friendship to America. I mean, it's really quite something. And it, Portland rains a lot, and it was, there was so much to learn, I had to go back. Each of the three days I was in Portland, <laughs> I didn't see anything else. There was just so much to learn, and so much to learn. Um, everywhere you look, there's something to learn about design, you know, inside and out. Well, and one of the things that you and I have talked about a, a lot, and that we wanted to drive home T tonight was this connection, exterior and interior design connection that is often overlooked or, or, or thought of at the last minute and, and you're often brought in much later in a project than you would like to, to, to be. Let me, to talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you know, um, we are often brought in a little late, it's true. And um, the connection of the spaces is very similar to interior design and very similar to architecture. How do you flow out to the spaces? How do you flow in? Um, you know, how are they furnished? Are they comfortable? Are they welcoming? Um, how do you make sure that someone wants to eat outside? Because outside it could rain and there are bugs. Let's face it, you know, there are bugs and there's all kinds of issues. The food can get hot, too hot in the sun. Um, you know, so how do you understand all of those things and the whole 
uh, way that we live in the warmer climates here in America and, the, and sort of the lifestyle that's shown us of indoor, outdoor, and we're trying to do it in the Northeast, that's also a struggle. Um, we certainly honed in on that during COVID, the pandemic, when everyone wanted to eat and live outside in the dead of winter. <laughs> you know, that was a really interesting moment. And I thought, if we can keep them outside when they don't have to socialize outside, then we will have really learned something from this. And we did. We absolutely did. And I think that people learned that they want to be outside. And um, I think that when one of the best things we can do um, as designers with nature is just to get you outside. And then Mother Nature will do all the rest. If I get you outside for about an hour or two, the sun, the shadows, the sounds of the birds, the movement of everything and the wind, the air, that's going to grab you. And so I often think that our spaces are the segue where people can sort of draw, you know, they come into a domestic space that's outside, they feel comfortable, and then they'll be drawn closer and to nature where I think in Eastern philosophies and cultures, we know very, they know very well that they want a sanctuary that's outside. And so that's always inside the house, right? It's a private space. And in Western cultures, we want the outside of our houses to look fantastic. And that's really a very interior thing that can happen when you're outside, a very spiritual thing, very connective thing to nature and the magic that is out in the universe <laughs> for us all. And if we can get you out there, I often say, you know, Mother Nature is the easiest partner that I can have. And this is not the case for my friends who are interior designers. It's like, there's no hope for any help. It's just the, you know, they think <laughs> just get worn out and they get used the wrong way. But, you know, if I, it, everything just gets better outside. It gets older, it gets more beautiful, it gets more lush. And if I do like 4%, Mother Nature will do the other 96, you know? And it's incredible how collaborative it is. If you just show some respect, that's all that's needed. It's really all that's needed. When I didn't understand trees and was trying to really understand the names and what they want and what they didn't, I just sat down in front of a tree for like an hour. And you just look at the tree and you think, then it's gonna tell you everything. It's gonna tell you whether it's thirsty, whether mm -hmm. it's comfortable, whether, you know, it's, it's all there to be seen, but it takes, a little respect and a little time, right? But it's such a great, such an incredibly supportive partner, you know, um, to work with. Well, you, you touched on the fact that COVID seems to have transformed, certainly the outdoor furniture mm -hmm. industry has benefited mm -hmm. enormously. They're doing terribly well. Uh, mm -hmm. So <laughs> tell me how that translates to what you do and what you're being asked to do today? Because yes, people have woken up to their gardens and, and their outdoor spaces in a, in a very different way. And what do, they, what do they want from you besides all of your time and all of your energy? Yes, uh, and all of your brain. Well, I can tell you, I know what I do well, mm. and I know what I don't do well. And I don't do furniture well. I admire furniture, and I like most furniture. You know, if I go to the D&D &D building, it all looks good to me. But I don't, if, if it's well made, but I don't, I don't curate that well. And I work with interior designers who are so good at that. Um, so what I like to do is collaborate right from the beginning for the outdoor spaces with the uh, interior designer for how the furniture layout's gonna be. I've designed a million beautiful terraces and still, until I started working with furniture layouts, they weren't the right size, really, you know? I mean, you have to know how it's gonna be used, you don't want to make it too big, you don't want to make it too small, you want to make it comfortable, you want the circulation. And yes, I've learned all of those measurements and dimensions and I can, I can, you know, like most people can say to you, I'm going to put a couch, two chairs and a table, you know, um, and, and I'm going to be able to put a living room together. And my God, if they come home from work and someone's moved something, they know it. But when you go outside, the scale is very different. It's very, very different. And also, people feel entitled to move furniture outside. Like they come, like if they came to your house and moved all your furniture around, you wouldn't like it. <laughs> but people come to your outdoor terrace or to your pool, and they move the furniture wherever they want. You know, it's just like goes everywhere. Crazy. It's crazy. What are they thinking of? 
Um, David's thinking, just get really heavy <laughs> furniture. Yes. And then, yeah, they're, exactly. they're not going to move it at David's all. David's like, bolt it down. Bolt it down. And, um, and so, you know, I, I have been so um, impressed with the outdoor furniture in, let's say, the last, let's face it, 15, 20 years. Mm. But now it's really becoming incredibly refined and globally available. And it used to be pretty plain. I mean, it used to really be pretty plain. I'm going back. I've been doing this 40 years, so it was pretty plain. And um, I love the collaboration and interaction with the interior designers and getting their brain and <laughs> their view of things. It's just wonderful. Um, I mean, I will not buy furniture for people. If they don't have an interior designer, I will suggest a layout. Mm. Um, but I don't do furniture purchasing because that is someone else, you know, that is a specialty. That is a real specialty that requires, um, you know, training that certainly my staff does not have. And, um, and I love it. There's nothing, I was um, on a back room trip uh, to Rubelli and Bonaccini and these furniture makers in Milan. And I mean, I just wanted to buy every fabric and every piece of furniture. It's not that I don't love it, because I love it. I love it. That's the problem. I'm not. I'm not going to be able to curate it that well. Mm. But so we, we talked earlier about often not bringing you in 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 time. But when you do work with a great interior design partner, a David Kleinberg, for example. What, so what's that collaboration like? What, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> He's great. I mean, great, I know. I know. No, yeah. I mean, I know that we're going to have spaces where we're all got the same goal, right? I mean, for it to be incredibly well-crafted, um, incredibly comfortable, really custom-suited to the needs of that particular family and that particular client, and that the philosophy will be very much in line, right, and very supportive. And um, that sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not a no-brainer. I mean, there are some people, um, tend to be more in the architect side, um, who make everything very hard, right? Mm. And, and um, and I've, you know, and the collaborations still come out well, but I've been really blessed with um, collaboration with interior designers and, um, and I wanna know their vision because inside the house, people are really specific and they, they interact with their designer in very, very demanding and specific ways, right down to the soft drawer, to, you know, do their legs, you know, go like this when they sit in the table, like, Interior designers really know how people live, and they, people tend not to tell me a lot of that, because they, they'll pretend they know, they'll look at the planting plan, and they'll oh, that looks great, you know. Now we have, zoo, you know, now we have 3D and everything, so now they do know more. But they used to just look at plans, and they, you know, kind of didn't want to be, you know, stupid about it, so they'd just be, I'm sure it's going to be very pretty. They couldn't say, I want this pale white hydrangea, and I want this deep blue. Uh, they're getting much more educated, which is great, but the interior designer still knows no more about what they like and who they are, and that's really helpful to us um, for the work that we do outside. Well, so, and how do you have that kind of conversation? Because as you say, interior designers are often expert mm -hmm. at getting answers to tell me how you really live in your interior. How, how do you get at what goes on for people or what they want outside? How do you, how do you guide them? How do you, how do you help them understand? Because I'm, I'm sure they don't fully. Um, well, first of all, in all of our plans, I must say, we do put furniture in. Mm. So the c discussion can start, even with the interior designer, you know, who will then say, well, I want it this way or I want that. We do try to have learned over the years, finally, that our terraces really need to, you know, is it a living room? Is it a dining room? Is it a place where you're going to have cocktails? Is it a place where you're cooking and eating? Or is this an adult space? Is this a child space? Is this a re recreational space? And what do you want to do here? Um, the, the great thing that's happened is that people basically just want somewhere where their phone is getting a great signal. And, you know, they're going <laughs> to... And good. is there anything naturally you can do to enhance phone signal? Are there yeah, trees? Yeah, yeah. Can I be? get more whappers yeah. so that I get a great signal okay. like seven miles yeah. away? You know, that... Um, and, um, and, and that kind of thing um, it are, are really do help because mm. people don't need to have a lot of accoutrements. There is a big thing about outdoor TVs. What? 
Outdoor TV is a very popular. Tell me, tell me more. Is it sort of a, a outdoor TV a drive-in kind of thing? <laughs> I mean, when you're in the pool to watch TV. When you're in the pool to watch TV. To watch TV. To watch TV. Stop it. It's Casa Maca. There's really? a there's a um, a resort in Spain called Casa Maca, and okay. the younger the younger clients love. They sit outside and they have a cinema. And they sit in these wonderful chairs and they watch movies and they outdoors watch movies. with okay. string lights. And they are, I've been getting pictures of Casa Maca from my clients, and I'm like, Oof. so I don't. We're not in Spain, first of all. It's, it rains a, a decent amount, but there is a TV that collapses down into the ground. Mm. Okay. It comes up, it expands, and the speakers come out on arms. It's very, very technically fantastic, and then it goes back into the ground. It's very 007. It's fabulous. We're working with one of those, and that's going to be fine um, because you won't see it most of the time. But much to the AV people's dismay, I was pointing out that it's going to be in full sun most of the time if they don't move it because you're not going to be able to see anything in it when the sun is going down. And yeah. Yeah, all of that, and only has a small swivel. Right. Mm. And how many times do you think it really collapses before it stops working? Oh, right. that... Uh, um, two, two or three times, I'm Dennis, guessing? Dennis. I don't know. Dennis, I mean, say it's not true. All those TVs that are built into people's say beds, it's not true. right? They, say it's they not work true. once or say twice. Say it's not true. Okay. Say it's okay. not true. And right. then we built this um, sunken amphitheater kind of like seating for it. And then they came back with... Well, this is kind of anecdotal, but they came back with wanting to be able to charge their phone there, and I'm like, it's outdoors. <laughs> okay, it's outdoors. Okay, come fully charged, please. No, no, no. <laughs> you see, a lot of people are new to the outdoors. That's no. clear. That's clear. They no. haven't experienced no. this. The problem is all the conduits and all the mm. pipes. I have to put my plants in the ground. I can't constantly hit some underground utility, right? So this is really challenging. I have like a map all the time. I want to know where they're running everything because it's underground spaghetti. There is a ton of stuff there right where you need to be with your plants as well. So um, the more stuff people want, the harder it is um, to actually get it initially lush. You know, so um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that people want. Well, and that's one of the things that you've you've so often spoken about that people don't anticipate how much the maintenance and the upkeep right of all the beautiful things that they want planted and surrounding their home yes. how much upkeep and expense goes into all of that we, we go through the design process we like to bring up the budget pretty quickly um, and we're pretty we're experienced in it to current pricing in different markets and we have it all in an excel spreadsheet and everything that's outside is by cubic yard cubic foot tons, you know, like gravel is in tons and, you know, moving soils and things like that, which has a, a great expense. And we want to get that. People will often say they don't know what it costs, and, and generally that's true, but in their mind they have budgeted something. Um, that's the, and, and so I want to try to make that budget work because you can do a great design. You don't have to have it. It can be a grass terrace. It can be a gravel terrace. It doesn't have to be stone. I mean, a good layout is a good layout. The materiality can change outside and still be fantastic. So um, I don't worry about that. I just want them to understand once we design it and if they like it, that the maintenance is 90% going forward. 90% of a garden in a few years is how you take care of it. It's a living, breathing thing. I've often said to my interior design friends, you know, I understand the client may not be happy, but you don't go back and find the couch dead in the corner. <laughs> it might not be what they wanted, but it's not dead, okay, and all shriveled up. And, um, you know, so, so this is, you know, this is like a landscape architecture and design is really like forecasting, right? It's forecasting and strategizing the future because everything is moving. So, you know, I used to look, and we'll look at jobs that have a history, that have a past. And when I look at a piece of land, I want to know what the story of that land is. What was the story? What was here? Do I continue to tell the story? Does it matter? Do I mix it up? Do I put it all together? How am I going to get someone that exhilarating sense of, of, of excitement and 
beauty and lushness when they arrive home. And then, you know, as I studied and struggled with the concept of the past, because what is the past? Okay, you might have had a house there in 1850, but the past is a billion years ago also. And, um, and what is the future? And as I struggled to put them together, I realized that that is the story. The story, the past and the present and the future is the story of the land. You know, one doesn't exclude the other. So to be respectful to that, I do want to forecast the future, mm. making sure they take care of what we've put in. And also, which may not be something they care about or I discuss with them, that what we're putting in makes good sense for the land and for the way that the wind comes and the inclement weather or the sun, you know. So, and all the changes that might happen. And you look at some of the most beautiful um, plazas and business plazas that Dan Kiley, a great landscape architect, did, you know, starting in the 50s throughout America. Some of these have been destroyed simply because new buildings have come up and blocked the sun. They became places where there was a lot of vandalism. They became places where budgets changed, mayors changed and they weren't maintained anymore, and then they become very derelict. So, you know, this is, this is um, there's the great story of at Versailles when they put in, the Wurtz brothers put in these huge, beautiful boxwood hedges and clouds of boxwoods. They had to tear them all out because junkies and prostitutes were living in them. Mm. You know, so you've got to think about, you know, So what remember that doing? about boxwoods. <laughs> they, did, they attract the wrong crowd. Damn so boxwood. think twice, just saying. Versailles was a tough and lesson And they get a learn. blight. Like, yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. Boxwood. Ugh. Sure. They, they seem alluring. And, and everyone else. likes them. Yeah. They seduce you easily. Sure. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. No, it's no. Incredible. It's really incredible. But then you just end up with the riffraff. It is. Yeah. It's a cheap date. Yeah, yeah. Cheap no, date. No, no. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in a way, I'm looking at, you know, if it, you know you, the simple but most obvious thing that gets ignored so much is the tree just too damn close to the house. Does it want to be 120 feet? Or is it one of those trees you can prune a lot, won't be mutilated, and someone will actually pay the money and keep it pruned? You know, Beatrix Ferrand was an incredible American landscape architect at the turn of the last century. She was the first woman to become a licensed landscape architect. And she did Dumbarton Oaks, which is one of my favorite places in the world, in Washington, D.C. And she left a guidebook. This is this little guidebook that says what you have to do to keep Dumbarton Oaks in good shape. She mm. was forecasting it. You know, there's these two beautiful holly at the entrance on Georgetown Avenue. They'll be eight feet when I put them in. You're gonna allow them to grow to 16 feet. That means you can prune them to up to 20 years and then you need to rip them out and start all over again. Mm. She said what needed to happen, right? She said what needed to happen. And I'd say that 90% of a done landscape that someone wants to redo, not a natural site, but um, which also has other meanings, but is 90% is of it is gone to, what we call gone too far. It just went too far. It got too big, it got too leggy, nobody was really thinking about it. Your big trees get bigger every day, every day. And you don't realize that if you live there, you're like, yeah, I got this big oak. You don't realize in 10 years that big oak is now a very big oak, you know? And um, so and there's and a runs lot the you risk have to of, look of, there. of what? Of, of shading out everything shading that's out underneath everything. it, yeah. banging you in the face when you come out of the door, mm. you know, in the front door. Falling on your home one day, and sure, okay. Well, that's what people are worried about. So after some of the big storms in the last decade, there has been a bit of a war on trees. And we all know what the trees along the power lines look like, right? They mm. slice half of them off. Well, that makes the tree unstable, obviously. I mean, it's just going to go in the, you know, it's not going to stand much longer. But, you know, there is, there is uh, really um, honesty and sincerity in planting that is important to have, right? Like, what will really work and what really won't work um, to the best of whoever is designing its knowledge. Is there a war on trees, Janice? Is there is, is that an ongoing war? I wasn't aware. <laughs> I'm fighting I it with the aware. Million Trees Program. Are you? Yeah, we're fighting that war. Well, and, and talk, talk about the Million, before we jump into to images, talk about the Million Trees Program, because it is a, sure. a wonderful. Sure. Well, I've had the great honor and pleasure of working with New York Restoration Project for 25 years. Well, 26 years now, since they started. And at the time, in the 90s, Bette Midler moved back to New York City, and she wanted to just clean garbage. She had no big aspirations beyond that. Um, and um, I was talking earlier with a gentleman, High Bridge Park, which is on the Upper East Side, which is one of the most beautiful parks in New York, became, you couldn't even go in it. 
so many um, you know, dog, packs of dogs and homeless and gangs living in there. And we cleaned it for four years and brought out cars. And I think thousands and thousands of tires. People were dumping garbage there. Mm. And, uh, and then it grew into 52 community gardens. And then it grew into programs working with the Living Shoreline. And then we grew into learning gardens at the public schools. And then we grew into um, also working in NYCHA, the New York City Housing Authority, which is probably the place that is the worst place there can be to live in New York, is in a NYCHA project. Mm. And NYCHA is completely without any, uh, uh, like they won't let you in. They won't let you in to help anybody. So it's been like a 12 year struggle. And, um, and all of this ended up, Bloomberg was incredibly supportive of parks. There was like 12 glorious years for the parks department. And we Miss started, him? Yes, yeah. well parks certainly does. Mm. And um, we started the Million Trees program because by 2050, there's going to be a majority of, of people are gonna be living in cities all around the world, right? And so cities need to be in some way um, a good place to live. And it's been proven with statistically that where there is a greener neighborhood, there's less diabetes, there's less crime, um, the schools are better, all of those things. And the community gardens certainly do police themselves. And so this is all proven to a certain degree. I mean, there's no data that says it creates poverty alleviation, but it certainly creates a safer and healthier neighborhood that is proven. Mm. And the Million Trees program, we did it, finish it ahead of schedule and ahead of budget, and I was in the initial plannings of it, and I did the Cherry Tree Esplanade on the Upper um, East Side, right at Highbridge Park, which started the Million Trees program. And, um, and we got it done, and then that program went to other cities. So, um, yeah, you can, I, I'm quite safe in taking trees down on people's projects if I need to, if they need to go, because I, like, I got good karma with the tree gods. I'm like, okay, <laughs> if I kill a bunch of these trees and cut them down, it's okay, I'm planting more. And, um, and uh, it's, a very interesting, it's a very interesting effort that's been made to green cities and do it in that way and to be part of it has been um, really very meaningful um, and beautiful for me. Well, it's, it's a wonderful program. All right, so we are going to okay. jump into... Oh, I'm gonna, I've got to give you, you gonna, gonna my turn, bad side. Exactly, you're gonna turn a little <laughs> bit here so that we can talk about the landscape design process, okay? Okay, so the landscape design process, I grabbed this, this one because it's big and it sort of shows the overall process, and I'll just take us through it pretty quickly, and um, it's a reduced version anyway. So here's, this, here's the history, right? Here's this old estate. So we've got the history, we've got some history of who lived there, and it's 290 acres, and we get a site survey, and that's the story of the land right there, and it does matter. That's showing me the topography, I can see where the water is, I can understand what's going on, I can see the old buildings, I can understand the land. Um, if you read surveys long enough and often enough, they are in three dimensions to you. It took me probably 10 years to get that understanding. I struggled enormously with it. And then we look at it and we, we try to create, um, we do create an archetype analysis, because land, are, harks back to how I like to think of land in archetypes. So there's a suburban archetype, which is not a criticism, right? It's where there are people, there are cars, there's heavy usage, there's, there's constant coming and going. But in this piece of land, we had pastoral, which was wide open grassy fields, full sun, views. We had historic estate archetype, which was where there had been a home and driveways and still was. We have two farms, so it's a farm archetype. It's high traffic, farm equipment, animals, horses, barns. We had wooded ravines, very steep. I would love to do ski trails in there and a ski lift. I really, I suggested. <laughs> Maybe a couple of rope toes. Um, and, oh, sorry, and then a few other wetland and right down to the Hudson River. So, so that's that part. And then we look at, this is the magic of the land. So that's the story, here's the magic, the weather. That's magic. When people tell me they don't believe in magic, I say, have you noticed the weather lately? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because um, you can't control it. Mm. It affects all of us, and nobody understands it, which kind of is magic. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, and, and, t and tell us what we're really looking at here. I mean, okay, so what, what we're looking is. at is a Winrose, which is a great plugin. Um, and it'll show you the wins, um, and the data has been accumulated for over 50 years, of at any day of the year, you can see in that specific spot which way the wind is coming. That's important, because if I'm clearing big areas of trees or I'm building something, I gotta know that the wind is coming, I need a windscreen, the house needs to be protected for a windscreen. If we cut down trees that are in the wind's path, all the rest of the trees are gonna come down the next five years. They just are, because they're not protected anymore. Um, and then this is the azimuth of the sun, which is the path the sun takes in the sky. So it starts in the morning in the east, ends in the west, right? We all know that. But in the, in the winter time, it's very low in the sky. The days are shorter, the shadows are longer. It's particularly beautiful to me. And then in the summer, it's very high in the sky. You have a much larger time of day that it's full sun that you can't get out of it, and then it's to the east and to the west. So architects work with this nonstop, right? They'll want usually the breakfast room and the kitchen in the east. They'll mm -hmm. want, um, you know, evening living rooms in the west. And you know, if you can get a sunset view and a water view on land that doesn't flood, it's priceless. <laughs> That's all I can say. If you can get those things, you've got some piece of land. And so our concept design was laid out because even though it looked at the Hudson River, I thought we should have a lake. I thought if you're going to arrive at this estate, have, go buy a lake. Sure. Yeah, why sure. not, right? Let's dig a lake. Because I needed the fill because they wanted a flatter backyard. So it's a really not a great thing to bring hundreds and hundreds of tons of dirt around. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for everybody. You're bringing, importing, exporting. Not a great thing. So I thought if I can find it on site, uh, if we dig a pond, I'll get the fill, right? And, we, and it'll just somehow all work together. Uh, there was an orchard outside of the estate, so we're matching the orchard in the front. We're working with the different archetypes. We're laying out uh, some things are existing. The way we render it and work with it, there's the existing trees that are worth keeping that we're really highlighting. So a lot of inventory goes into that. And then we're, there, we're focusing in, and this is all going to the client, focusing in on around the house and what they were asking for, and then focusing in on their sports complex, which was very important to them. Their Lots. sports complex. <laughs> so, so flesh that out for us. It's you, gonna be a could. family compound. Okay. For future, they are forecasting their future of them all living there, you know, for 100 years. And uh, as they, they want indoor and outdoor, it's very specific sports. And so there's tennis court, pickleball, indoor tennis court, no animals. You could have had a great horse barn here, yeah. no animals. They don't have any animals. No, okay. the stable that was there is gonna be an indoor tennis court. Indoor tennis, I yeah. see, okay. And, um, and some of these are existing structures that we're repurposing. And because there's always permitting and architectural review boards and historical Hudson review boards, you have to take the existing buildings and work with them. You can relocate them maybe, but you have to work with them, so. And uh, another concept we always give the client to, still kept the lake, because I really need the lake. Mm. It's, uh, and, um, and just a different way of arriving and moving through the site. And um, obviously there's a far larger discussion that's had before these plans are drawn and with the client, but this is what it looks like, the other concept of coming up close to the house putting a formal garden in. I found pictures there was a formal garden at the house and I thought it should go back and the windows uh, went to it and the previous owner had ripped it out. I found photographs, aerial photographs, so I thought, you know, that would be nice, that would be pretty. And an outdoor kitchen um, that's covered so you can have your pizza and your pizza ovens and a bar and there's two bars and everything you could want if you're gonna have a lot of family entertaining. And this was the key. So this is the landscape architecture part. I can't give this to somebody if I haven't figured it out, right? I have to know that I'm gonna be able to do it if I'm even gonna present it. So that's a decent amount of time in a design process that because you're presenting a design, you're not necessarily being paid for that part, but you're really trying, if you're gonna take this big idea, you've got to understand what it means, that it can be done, and that what it will cost them. So we'll figure that all out. So we did the volumes and the cuts in a modeling program and we, we did sections and looked at it. We wanted to have an island in the pond. And I actually, and I'm, you know, I didn't bring them all, but we did a spreadsheet in the presentation of what the cost for that would be. Um, just so that, you know, 
you know the next question, if they love the idea of a lake, is going to be, what does it cost me? So you might as well answer it. Sure. <laughs> sure. Right? You might as well get right through it. Are, you know, are we're at the beginning of the design process. Are we doing a pond or are we not? Um, and, um, and so that, you know, that's underway. Got it. Okay. So this is a Long Island estate, which really speaks to what we were talking about before, which is my, my I'm just going to read you a quote, which has been another part of my career that has um, been so meaningful to me. And um, so there is a quote by Mary Bronson Hart from the book Women and the Art of Landscape Gardening, 1908. Uh, about the women who entered the demanding and difficult profession of landscape architecture in the early 20th century. Quote, not for one instant will all this daunt a woman to whom landscape design is a master passion. She exults in the demands upon every power of mind and body. In other words, she is an artist, and in so far as her art is concerned, she is a willful fanatic. <laughs> I like that a lot. And I describe these two women to me. Um, people know more about Beatrix Ferrand and Ellen Biddle Shipman, and I've had the great pleasure of redoing uh, an Ellen Biddle Shipman gardens a few times. But Rose Standish Nissel was also um, very, very good. And her, you know, gardens are ephemeral. They disappear. They're gone. You know, there's plants, but the plants will go quickly. So Charles Platt was at the beginning of a lot of that. And then this is Annette Hoyt Flanders, who's even more interesting. Um, she was born after, but died before, Rosa Stan uh, Standish Nichols. And in 1920, she worked at uh, Vitali Brinkerhoff and Giefert, which then turned into Parsons Brinkerhoff, which I'm sure it brings a bell to people. And now it's uh, just um, uh, Parsons. Um, I mean, it's just Brinkerhoff now. Mm. But I mean, this firm is an engineering. Uh, engineering and design firm been around forever and ever and ever. So she also, if you look at what the next the next slide, she wrote this. I don't quite get it, but I love it. <laughs> I don't get it though, <laughs> but I really love it. And um, and she had this theory, and this was her theory, and she wrote books on it, and it's fabulous. And then the next slide, she <laughs> also would make clay models of her gardens for people, glaze them, bake them, and give them to them. <laughs> she made pottery models of her gardens. <laughs> like, I, like Martha Stewart, I you love know? It. I, I mean, love when it. the garden was done, you got like a gingerbread house. <laughs> and, uh, you know. <laughs> but there's very few that exist because people would stick them up in their attic and then the houses would get sold and then the next generation would be like, what is this thing? <laughs> and so there's very few around, but I'm dying. If anyone ever hears of one, I am dying to collect these things. See, she Karen, it really them. is a gingerbread house. Yes. yes. She made the models of her gardens for people, glazed them. I love it. I, I, <laughs> oops, who could not love this woman? <laughs> Okay, so okay. we had an estate and we found the old pictures for it. And then on the next, next slide, what we did is we added on um, a lily garden and a, and a pool garden and sort of tried to bring it into the future and we rendered it for the client in, on the old renderings to kind of, you know, again, the story. What is the story? How do you take the past? How do you bring it into the future? It does matter because they're the same. You know, and, and there's this Japanese saying that I probably am butchering, but it's, you know, your strength is your weakness and your weakness is your strength. And when it comes to land, that is just, I mean, I think it's true about many things, but a land it is, right? But and so tell me what same. that means. So what, so what does that mean when you say, when Well, you could say land, the strength of the house is that it has a western facing uh, sunset and river, but wherever you find that on the Hudson, you've got Route 9 and you've got the sound if you find it along the coast of Connecticut, you've got 95 behind you. Mm, okay. um, you've got, you could flood. I mean, there's always, to every strength, there's a weakness, right? You might say, my strength is I have this giant open field that I can do anything on. But it's actually a weakness because it's not that interesting. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then if you have all ledge rock and you have all these grade changes, that's a weakness because you have no open field, but you yeah. also have to build retaining everywhere. You know, it's like Italy. You've got to just keep terracing and terracing and terracing. So you try to take the weakness of the land, um, if, and uh, hopefully there is some strength because some land is built, built on so many times that some of it is not great. Mm -hmm. um, and you, as, as uh, one of my favorite eco-conservation authorities from um, 
uh, ESF Sunni said to me when I took him to look at a piece of land in Southampton, he said, torch it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what do you mean? We got, he said, just torch it, <laughs> start again. <laughs> so, you know, but you, you want to balance those things. The big old trees are strengths, mm. right? Always, always, always. You, you know, to quote uh, Nathan Orsman, the great lighting designer, if you don't leave him big trees, he can't do anything for you. He just mm. can't help you. So, you know, but they're also beautiful and it feels like Central Park and they're soulful and gorgeous, but at the same time, if you don't have anything else, you know, how do you start planting trees for the future? Do you have any real garden spaces because they have taken up a lot of room? You know, it's a, there's always a, it's a fine dance. You know, it's a fine dance. So we, we worked away on this thing. We got some plans going and we redid the walled gardens, which were completely neglected and derelict. Um, and we worked with some colors that the designers would like. And this is just kind of a process. Um, we found at this bottom picture, there were over 30 different types of balustrades that had been replaced. None of them matched. We were trying to say, oh, we'll do balustrades again. But there wasn't a single existing balustrade that was the same almost. So then it was a question of which balustrade do we copy? We made pebble mosaics. And it was very important to me to copy this old decrepit pergola we saw. Um, but then it, you know, it was rebuilt with lights in it and things like that. And it was also very important to me to save the old brick paths, which had a lot of resistance. It was, unfortunately, I learned on the job. This was my first historical recreation. And I didn't know exactly how to defend what my instincts were, but I learned. Mm. Um, but I knew that if we, everyone kept saying we could put in new brick paths to look old. But I'm like, but they won't be old. Well, they'll look the same, but they're not the same, right? Like the charm is that they're old, mm -hmm. right? So you can't do it. So finally, after fighting with them, I had steel plates put on everything and mulch and we kept them. But they are treacherous, you know, in heels. But <laughs> they are know, a liability, sure. They are a liability. Sure. I mean, but they hey. look fantastic. Yeah, they're just yeah. fantastic. <laughs> but it's real. Do you know what I mean? It's real. And if you, uh, why do a historical recreation if you take out everything and do it again? Then it's not. Right. Then it's a new garden. So we redid everything. So there it is. And um, we put a fountain in the middle and we rethought it all. And again, this is, it's a rose mm -hmm. garden. Now the boxwoods are getting too high and the roses are very tall. And so every year I have to beg, borrow, and steal to get them to keep the boxwood low. Mm. Um, so, you know, again, now it's all about maintenance. Now it's all about keeping the vision um, and not letting it go too far. So um, it, uh, it, 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 the big trees, everyone said, cut these big cherry trees, they're sticking into the pergola. I'm like, no, you'll have to kill me first. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do suspect that when I'm not there, they cut the branches. Again, looking at an old lily pond, the concrete actually is dead. I didn't know concrete could die, but after like a hundred and something years, it can die. You can stick your pencil in it, it turns to dust. At that point, you have to take it out. When you take out an old pool or lily pond, you create an overdig and an unstable soil if you're trying to put it back in the same place. So the whole thing becomes extremely complicated. Um, and then down here, you know, we would, we'll just draw the model of the urn um, or cut them out of cardboard to get everyone to agree exactly on what size needs to go there. Because there's always a team. There's interior design and there's architects and engineers and clients and everybody has a thought about it. And we want everyone to be making the decisions together. It makes it better. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to be the only person making them. I'll make my suggestion and then give everybody an option to weigh in and then do whatever the hell I want. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's called, I think that that's called, um, uh, I think that, that there's a name for that, but I'm not, totalitarianism? Well, I've, I've heard tell that. Is know, that what it is? But, but the you, liberal fascist. But you let people participate and you. Yes. And, and sometimes they go behind your back and do other things. Yeah, but it's all a great process. And it's all so much fun when you go to lay out the plants and you've got the old trees that were kept, new trees that go in. And, um, and so that was the lily pond, we got it done. And the greatest thing about water and keeping trees near water is the reflections and the reflections at night. It's like, makes me feel like, 
you know, Monet would be pleased. And um, I always, you know, trees drop leaves into pools, but I always want a, a tree near a pool, so when I light the pool and the tree is lit, you get that magical reflection, you know, it's mm. everything. Um, and so just kept some old trees, put in some new trees, and uh, played around till we got it right. Mm. And uh, now the boxwoods have overtaken that area of the, of the soft, smushy stuff that I put around, so now they, they roll. But you have to have something to, to get you going at first. Mm. And they did choose an urn size. <laughs> they did. We did. We did just just ferns. They got to. They got to choose that. Everything, yes. Yeah. And you know that's yeah. how it should be. Yeah, it's how it should be. And this is the moment that I didn't know I'd been waiting for all my life. <laughs> Cherry blossoms, oh. Kwanzaa cherries, which I was a snob about for so long, and they're so beautiful. I don't know what my problem was. Were you? What? What did you I, think? I, oh, I mean, they. Oh, I had. You know, when you you're were young. Bourgeois? When you're I, young, okay. I thought they were bubblegum pink. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. What was wrong with me? I looked at them one day and I'm like, God, they're gorgeous. Okay. So you live and you learn, but you can't tell that it's not good. But the, everything is pink. The masonry is pink. The paths are pink. I didn't know I wanted pink walls and pink masonry. I didn't know how much I wanted that my whole life. I didn't even like pink. I love pink now. <laughs> and the blossoms in the water. There is a florist in Belgium named Daniel Ost mm. who actually creates forms that he floats like for fashion shows and things and fills with petals and the form might be a heart or it might be a shape and then they float it in the water or the reflecting pools and I, I just love his website like you just have to go the OST. It ha I actually went to see his store and meet him. Um, it's just gorgeous stuff, just gorgeous. And this is the old paths and the old brick. And I don't know what any of it meant, but I knew we had to keep it. And she's new. She's the naiad. She's at the new pool. She looks great. She's having a great time. <laughs> she's, so, she's so fabulous. She's having a great time. We all had so much fun laying in place, like and getting our picture taken <laughs> to see if it would fit there. You know, like Christina's world, right? The painting, <laughs> Christina's world, where everybody poses to see if you, yeah. So we had everyone lay down to make sure it was the right size. And uh, and then um, mm. these are these incredible hornbeam trees that this nursery clips them. The nursery we were speaking about. The nursery that you can't get anything because mm. RH has bought everything. Yes. Oh, for goodness oh. sake. One of the best nurseries in the Northeast where they really only sell to brokers. They don't even sell to nurseries. So there's a wholesale tree farms, sell to nurseries, um, to you know, retail nurseries, and, and to, to job, you know, projects. And the very best one, which is kind of a fanatical one, where they grow everything absolutely perfectly and they'll only sell to certain people, RH bought everything for their, for their display garden. And it, it wasn't cheap. That, I mean, they weren't, this was like buying real diamonds, not getting fake ones for your real retail store. Um, anyway, they had them, they were flat top, they were full, they were gorgeous. So we created a garden for them because we were like, okay, well, you gotta walk around and go through the service entrance and go to the garage, so let's make it a hornbeam garden. Well, and they are so stunning. So I mean, stunning. Just, I mean, so stunning. Really. Um, they had to be had. Well, and, and what does it take to keep them like? That. Is that a year uh, uh, twice a season okay twice a season and and you know it is a job they have to have the right ladders and they have to know what they're doing and it's not that predictable right if we have a lot of rain they'll grow mm. so you know I basically don't for myself irrigate and feed most of my plants I only irrigate and feed if I want them to grow I, I mean I water for growth so you know it's a question of just understanding and having a good caretaker it's cut back we won't have to prune as often Right, because plants are kind of like Labrador retrievers. If you pet them, they go crazy. So if you trim a tree, it goes nuts. Oh, you paid attention to me. You water it. Oh, you paid attention to me. You <laughs> feed it. Oh my God, I'm gonna grow now. And, um, and, and it gets all excited, right? And then you have to come in and prune it. If you prune it, oh my God, you pruned me. That's so great, I'm gonna grow some more, you know? 
Uh, so you gotta cut back on all that stuff. You know, you gotta cut back on all that stuff. But you, you can't tell clients when they pay a lot of money for an irrigation system that in two years, if you've done your job well, they can turn it off on everything but the lawn. Because the lawn, of course, has to agree. But uh, that's what they should do, except for in an emergency or in a drought. Um, fertilizer creates like a, an athlete that's just on steroids, right? I mean, it, they appear vigorous, but they don't have vigorous, robust health, really. So the roots are all on the surface, surface, they're grabbing the water from the irrigation, they're grabbing the fertilizer right on the surface. They're not growing deep, long roots that can really sustain them in a drought. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a process of education. Um, and, and people feel safe if they feed and prune. They're like, yeah, I got this. My plants are doing really well. Like, well, you know, your budget isn't doing very well. <laughs> right, because that's the thing, as you were that's saying. That's what's expensive. Get, get them excited, and then you've got to maintain them. Very constantly. expensive to prune and, and talk, constantly prune and constantly feed. And so for yourself, you're just letting nature do its thing. I, I water, when I really want some growth, I will right. water and feed. Okay. Yeah, I will. Like, uh, just, and like the first year to get everybody started and settled in. Mm. But then I'm gonna let the, you know, the toughest survive. Let them duke it out and see. Let them duke sure. it out. If they can make okay. it on their own, they can stay. Okay. If they're really needy. Well, that's the thing. Do you want them around if they're if really needy? Who likes right? a needy I mean, plant? Yeah. <sighs> So much drama. Well, nothing worse. I mean, like we, like we talked about my magnolia, and you told me I had to sing to it, and I had to do all these things. And They're divas. They really the are. Magnolias are just divas. They're terrible. And people go crazy trying to keep them alive, and then you see one growing through a subway grate. Happy yes. as a clam. <laughs> and then you're like, that's what it wanted, to be ignored, not fed, not watered, yelled at, you know? And, and meanwhile, we just love them to death, and they just sit there like, eh. Uh, I'm not growing. Guess well, what? So I'm not growing or blooming for you. Yeah, they're divas. They're just divas. They're unbelievably fussy. They really are. You have to be very careful with them. I mean, I love them and I'll use them a lot, but Do I you don't them trust them. Yes, but I don't trust them. I just <laughs> they're not trustworthy. No, and they let you down constantly, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. well, we do bad things to them. We put them in a beautiful lawn with, with lawn heads that smash them. Then we put mm. drip irrigation on them. Then we feed them. Mm. And they're like, I wanted a subway. Great. What are you doing here? You know, but um, no, but they're very notoriously difficult to move in large sizes and extremely temperamental. And once they settle in, they're fine. Mm. And, and for how long? I mean, how, how long do they tend to, to, to be fine? Because our, our, our magnolia has, has has passed on, I think, and I, uh, I have, I think I've seen back. them like over 80 and 90 years really? old, spectacular, in the wind, on the sound, hmm. um, cabled, but in a very inclement situation and gorgeous, just gorgeous. So there is an element of life force, right? There's an element of life force. And this is explained, not to give you a biology class, but this is explained by the mycorrhizal web that connects us all on the planet. Or as some people, if you look, look up Paul Stamets, the mushrooms, the fungus, it's the energy web, and it goes throughout the whole planet. And, you know, it's like there are thousands of species of uh, bamboo, but they flower globally all at the same time. How do they know? They, they know. They know. And uh, the military's known this for years about mushrooms. You have to be careful. Paul Stamets has some great videos on it. He's uh, the mushroom guy but he has a hat made out of mushrooms. So when you might not take him seriously. <laughs> yeah, huh. But he's a scientist and he works for the military. So right. basically the roots have fungus that they like, mycorrhizal in the, in the soil. And there's hundreds of thousands of millions of mycorrhizal. So if I'm an oak tree, I like mycorrhizal, I need it to grow and it's on my roots, but mm. there's specific ones I really like. Like if you have me go live in Tokyo for three years, I will eat sushi, mm. but I'm not gonna be that happy, right? I'm gonna want a mac and cheese. This is you personally? Personally. Okay, I'm gonna you're, gonna, you're gonna be longing for mac and cheese, but you're settled I'm gonna for the want sushi that you But I'm okay. not gonna die. No. But I don't have my favorite food. Right. 
if the, and they've been trying to match up, scientists work on this, to match up the exact mycorrhizal that work with the exact different species. Mm. But it's like, it's very hard. There are so many, it's very hard. They've got them down to like, like basic groupings that everybody will eat, like everyone will eat rice and every plant will take a certain kind of meat. But the ones that are the favorites, are you know they get close with some species but it's a real it's a real trick so you know if if that tree that i'm talking about is clearly got all of what it needs right there it's happy mm. right so i bring a fussy tree like that and put it somewhere where none of its favorite foods are <laughs> but you know i mean it's fine it's not going to die but it's not going to thrive right it's not going to thrive and so they're living things, and that's, you know, th that's the part of the forecasting of the future. What are they going to do? The understanding of the past. What have they been through if you're keeping them? And that they're both things, and, they, you, know, and, and you can't say when they're going to go and when they're not going to go and how long they'll live. Though I mean, with certain, like, unfortunately, those beautiful cherry trees are known mm. for cankers, and they, they live out of 60 years. That's about it. But um, they have no death built into them, trees. They actually have no death cycle built in. Um, that's why you can drive through the redwoods mm. out in uh, California. You know, you can do almost anything to them. They, they, you know, they, they die from trauma. So either they get trauma naturally or from a storm and then they become weak and then the diseases and the bugs and the insects all set in. But if a tree does not have trauma, it's not going to be prone to trauma and to a death cycle. It's just not built into them. Hmm. The range of learning with Janice Parker. I think that's what I, <laughs> that's what I want you to appreciate, you know, the depth that, we, that we're going to go into. Um, so, wrapping, so wrapping this up. Yep, we go right through. There's some bananas in there. And then this is... Oh, um, this is right, okay. Yeah, this is a project that sits also on a large piece of land. It has a pond. <laughs> and, um, and, and it had the pond. I didn't have to dig it. And this was a dream come true. This was a client. It was his dream it was you know it's his money it's his house he works hard for it his mother is a rose breeder in Denmark and he walked into my office with a book of antique David Austin roses filled with post-its and he said I want these and more but and then described why he liked the pink of one and he didn't like the pink of the other and that he liked this one like and I'm like oh no I don't know enough about roses for this. So I called Stephen Scaniello, who's the rosarian at the New York Botanical Garden, who's the rose god. He actually introduced himself that way. <laughs> yes, rose god. He does. He's not, he's very confident. <laughs> and very confident man. And he's a deity. Yeah, he's yeah. a god. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's. Uh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, uh, and yet so humble, he comes and he digs everything in. And I said, Stephen, yeah, you know, I've used him on a few projects when someone really wants roses. Mm. We bred roses with him, you know, for the client. We bred a Bette Midler rose, a Divine Miss M rose with oh. him. And, um, and so he, um, he, he, they had a great time. They just had a great time. They got along like a house on fire. <laughs> and uh, Stephen designed this gorgeous rose garden in West Hartford very beautiful and um, and so this is on his way up from the botanical garden so he stops when he's going up there once a week so it's really fantastic and the client understands that mm. right understands that he's got um, Stephen and who Stephen is right and so to be able to facilitate that relationship for them was just wonderful um, and I not once it crossed my mind that I could be that person you know, because the depth of knowledge needed to be just complete. Yeah. Right. So, so it's a simple home. It's a very okay. simple home. Uh huh. Do okay. you know that there's actually not a formal dining room in this house? What? Stop it. Because what they were eating. For the interior eating? designers, I mean, it's shocking. I went in the house. I'm like, okay, where it should be right here. You know, because I always want to know what room is looking out at what, and you know, you know that the master is over here, and you know that the dining room and the breakfast area. I mean, you know all these things because you're creating the spaces to work with them. I'm like, and it's not here. Where to it go? It's gone. It doesn't exist. It's very challenging. 
we did fountains, we did gravel paths, we mm. had such a good time. <laughs> um, tennis court, uh, his daughter is a tennis player. And we were able in, to have a client who actually was interested in obsessing about just how many inches above the gravel the metal edge should be. He liked the conversation. I can barely find anyone in my life to talk to about that, even if I pay them a salary. <laughs> they don't want to talk to me about that. And I, they're like, oh, she's talking about the steel edge again. And I'm like obsessing on the steel edge, <laughs> two and three quarters inch. What will look the best? Let's mark it up. And they're like, oh, God, Janice, just a slide, three inches, oh two my inches. Gosh. Uh, hopefully there's some tight shots of that. Okay. Oh, well, but you uh, see how the grass sits mm. slightly up? The grass around the beds? Mm. To me, that's like everything. I'm sorry. It's a little. Can you see that where you are? Can you see the grass? <laughs> okay. Okay. I like the big picture, but then I can get oddly obsessed. And so we, we decided to play with the parterre idea of instead of having, um, you know, there's an old saying, you know, unexpected plants in the expected places and expected plants in the unexpected places. So we use these cream, like little cream balls of um, weeping green Japanese maples, which are one of my favorite plants in the world, as centerpieces in these formal parterres instead of boxwoods. And, um, and they're beautiful because they have beautiful fall and spring color and gorgeous sort of reddish bark and they light beautifully in the winter. And let's face it, boxwood doesn't light well. Evergreens don't light well. You just get a hot spot. They're meaningless. They don't do anything. It just doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't help you. Take it creates note. no Take atmosphere. Okay. And, um, and so we just had a great time with him. And, um, and we actually planted all of this in, in one season after, you know, it took three years to build it. But. And, um, and he sent me recently a picture of that fountain with a bobcat in it. Oh. I thought at first, I'm like, did he get a cat? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't like animals. And I look closer, I'm like, that is one big crazy looking cat. And it was a bobcat. Because he was trapping the raccoons. So the bobcat saw all these like lunch sitting in traps all over the garden, like, oh, I'll take a bath while I stare at my lunch oh, that's in right. the cage, you know? Oh, so he was trapping the raccoons. And yeah, and the yeah. raccoons are like, ah, because <laughs> the bobcat. <Yeah. laughs> you know, I didn't know yeah. I had to learn about wildlife. We, we actually did a, a, a turtle rescue, mm -hmm. which you have to have like little radio transmitters on them, and you have to go through the DEC, and we, we did that. I don't. <laughs> And there he oh. is, my lovely, lovely client walking his dog. Oh. Hopefully not at the time the bobcat is out. No. Oh, no, no. no. So this is one thing about the past and the future. This little diminutive, lovely garden ornament is from Dumbarton Oaks. And the first time I went to Dumbarton Oaks, like 30 years ago, I fell in love with it. And of course, what we did is we sort of just started playing with the scale of it and having fun because you always want to create focal points for a sculpture, and everyone's going to get a sculpture. But getting a sculpture is actually very hard. I don't know that because I've never tried to get one. But um, the people who go shopping for sculpture have a very hard time. It's hard to find sculpture. It's expensive. They, they're getting a sculpture. They're never getting the sculpture. Like, it could be five years. So I said, well, let's put something. This is relatively inexpensive. These are a plinth and an urn from Long Shadow. It's under $1,000. We make a metal trellis to go over the top. It lights beautifully. I don't put any plants in it because Beatrix Ferrand didn't. So, I mean, sure. she knew best. And um, there's these great pictures of her with the Blisses, who she worked for. The Blisses made Dumbarton Oaks. And they're very stout in their like tweed outfits and long <laughs> skirts and hats. And they're standing there with these like plywood cutouts of the urn. It's just the best it's just so good <laughs> and um and you know philip johnson did his first architecture commission for dumbarton oaks hmm. for the blisses they had him build a small museum a library for them very oh. modern yeah it's fascinating yeah so um so i thought okay let's do it we drew it up some people use one urn some people use the other the vines this was the first year the vines come up on top and they will get a sculpture at some point and we'll move this to somewhere else in the garden <laughs> but it works great and then we go down into the natural, which is important to keep those segues. And then um, I just, this is my favorite detail I've ever done, these stairs. 
And again, the people in my office were like, just. Yeah, yeah. how long did they hear, have to hear about these stairs? You'll put them in the, you, you just, we did the grading plan, it'll be fine. I'm like, but is it gonna have this much reveal? And it's, because I knew it was possible to do stairs that didn't cost a fortune with concrete. And that would also feel like an old English, you know, very relaxed and like they'd been there for a while. Um, and we had a great, we had a great time doing it. And, um, and then he and his daughter take care of the vegetable garden. Hmm. It's wonderful. And that's it. And that's the, that's the aerial view. That's the aerial view. And that's my book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which, which Janice is very kindly donating to the school so that the school can have her book in the library should you students want to refer to it at some point in the future. So it is there for you, and that's very, that's very kind and generous. Should we see if there are any questions I would love that. out in the audience? Does anyone have a question? We have microphones on there are either some side professionals here. of the room. Okay, yes, I see, I see a, a professional right now. a question from a non-professional. How do you help the client understand how a tree is going to be in five years or 10 years? Um, it's a simple growth chart. We can show it, you know, we used to hand draw it, but we can show it in a, um, in a rendering. So you might show the elevation of the, the, oh, the building? Oh, we will show the elevation. Then, yeah, we will show the elevation. And then show it five years later, yes. 10 years later? Absolutely, yeah. And you know, good nursery catalogs do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, they will show that, the growth pattern. I mean, it's a bit of a crystal ball to know how well it will grow, because in the first, if, it's a, if you put in a big tree, the first two or three years, it doesn't do much. Um, there's an old saying my grandmother used to say, you know, first year it weeps, second year it creeps, third year it leaps. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but that's often one of the challenges, right, is you do have to tell people that I know it doesn't look like this now, but in two, three years, it's going to really, right? I mean, yeah. they, have to, they have to have a bit of vision. You know, I do have this one firm, and I don't know what kind of secret Italian bug juice they make, but they put stuff in, and it's gorgeous in a season if they maintain it. I don't mm. know what they're pouring on it. I really don't. But it's, they are extraordinary. They're, comes in a plastic jug. I don't know, maybe it's red wine, maybe it's tea, <laughs> whatever they're doing. Whatever they're doing, it's pretty magical. It, it does amazing things. It okay. pops, the stuff pops. Any, any other questions from our, from our crowd before we let Janice go? Oh, oh, Jill, yes? Okay, let's get your microphone. Calling me by my name. <laughs> so um, this was fascinating. My question is, um, how much of a dialogue do you have over the course of a project with the interior designer? Um, are you constantly talking back and forth? And take that house, for example, the last one that you showed us. What stylistically is there inside? Um, is it antiques? Is it traditional? Or do you ever get anything that's really minimal on the inside? Um, what's the back and forth? Well, I, sure, I happen, these projects I grabbed are traditional, but we work with a lot of, of modern, you know, projects. And so at the beginning, there'll be a lot of discussion. And I think that we might even know each other and we'll understand, right? And I am definitely going to listen very carefully and, and, um, and really try to be the beta in that conversation of what they're looking for. Because it's important to me that the architect and the interior designer and the client all really like the product, right? And, and, um, and then we will discuss it and in the planning, we will work with the layouts. But at that point, generally the exact finishings and fabrics and type of furniture might not have been chosen. Just here's the living room, here's this. And that's really essential because the interior designer is doing so much about the walls and the, I mean, everything inside has to be done, right? For the, and the, the furniture is usually gonna be for the outdoors will probably be one of the later things they consider once they get everything organized in the house. Um, and that's normal. Um, and then during the site visits, um, as the house becomes more put together, the interior design team will be there more. So we'll see them every week. And that's really great because we develop sort of a conversation about 
you know, um, I, can, I can read a mood board to a degree, but it's really nice to see, you know, them working with the different artisans. I mean, seeing things through other designers' eyes um, has taught me everything I know. You know, uh, traveling and meeting architects and interior designers and seeing what they see and learning to appreciate what they're looking at and why. It may not be the medium or the materials I'm working with, but their eye is so fine, right? And so, so, um, so educated and, and understanding what they're looking at. I mean, really, it's, it's very, very good training. Sure. <laughs> yes, okay. So how long between when you finish the project do you actually photograph it? because I know you talked a lot about the growth period for the plant. Sure. Well, this last job was the same season, the next, within six months, right? I try not to do that, obviously, um, because you want to let it grow in for a while. But sometimes there's a push. Um, the architect wants to, to photograph it right away. Um, and then, you know, really good photography is expensive. So I'm more than happy to, to do it with them, you know, and it's a joint project. And... Um, but I would like to wait two years, you know, and then you don't know the weather. So right before everything fries in mid-July and right after it's bloomed and looks pretty good. So you've got like, and then every good photographer has booked those 14 days, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I like to see pictures in the winter and in the spring, you know, at all different times of year. And that's really important to me. And I have a lot of that in my book as well, because I love the winter landscape. I just love it, and it's so naked, and it's so exposed, and you see really what's going on. And you also see all the houses and gardens you never knew were there on that street. I mean, it's really helpful, but now with Google Earth Pro, I can look at everybody's garden. When I started, I was like, could I think I could go up that driveway. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld's bodyguard threw me out once. I didn't know it was his house. I was just trying to see the garden. I'm like, I know the mason. And they're like, you have to leave right now. I'm like, I just, I'm going to talk to this. I wanted to see what was going on. And then I realized, oh boy, you know, I guess I seem like a crazy fan. I was just trying to see the garden. Oh. And, uh, and so now I can see everything. I have just spent hours traveling the world looking at everybody's gardens all over the world. It's On Google Earth. Pro. Pro, yeah. The pro, pro. version, right. The no, pro no, no. version. Sure. You know why? It has a history timeline. So you can go back and see the If there were good there. pictures. If there were good pictures, you can go back. Yeah, it's, mm. it's really interesting. You can look at stories. You, again, the stories. What's come, what's gone, what's been there, what isn't there. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's really a whole world um, that you can, can look in on. And I don't know how they got the rights to take pictures of everybody's house, everybody's street, and everybody's backyard. But they did, and it's all out there and available, which somehow doesn't seem completely OK. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I know where Putin's villa is on Sardinia. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Sardinia. It's underground, but you can see where the boats come in. It's like Dr. No. It's Dr. No, I'm telling you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, but the whole house goes down, and then there's this, like, rock that's fake that boats go in. I got a little intel. Um, <laughs> Not that she spent any time on this. There's all, just take a look around um, Buckingham Palace someday at the backyards there. Very interesting. <laughs> so, so download your pro version of Google Earth. Some of the most beautiful gardens in London, you can look at them. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous. They just really beautiful layouts and designs. You know, and uh, it's, it's incredibly educational. Um, I, I mean, when I started, not to date myself, but there wasn't even one hour photo. I used to have to wait a week for the pictures to come back. <laughs> when there was one hour photo, it's like, whoa, I can see pictures of the job I just looked at, you know? And now, you know, you have your camera, you look at them right away, you can go on Google Earth Pro, you can be so much more knowledgeable. But you know what's around, like everyone has a swimming pool in this neighborhood, and they don't. Right? Or, I mean, you can just look at the whole neighborhood and know how, you know, really, this is who they're visiting. These are the people they have dinner with. This is what it looks like back there. 
And there was no way of knowing that before. Do you get to watch them living their lives in real time? No, I it's mean, not real time. Okay. That's, the Google, okay. that's, that's Google Pro Pro. <laughs> yes, that's, that's the really premium part. That's Google yes. Special Ops. Mm. Um, the right. military has that. Yeah. If you have military security clearance, you I, do get that. I'm nervous that they do have that. They do have that. it in the yeah. Pentagon. They absolutely do. Okay. I've asked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to. They good do to, have it. They're watching you. Good to know. They're watching you. Okay. They're watching us yeah. right now. No, no, I, I. <laughs> on Alexa. I hope they're learning a lot. On Alexa, that. they're watching you yes. anyway. People put a sock over that thing. Yes. Yes. Put a sock over the camera on your don't, computer. Exactly. What are you thinking? Don't, don't leave your Alexa unexposed. Listen. What, what do you think if, they're doing? They're listening to you. <laughs> what are you thinking by having Alexa on? That's what my computer wizard said to me. Well, just throw it out right now and put a sock over your camera when you're not using it. What do you think a you're sock. doing? Yes. But there you go. Uh, good, uh, good, again, good <laughs> tips. Good <laughs> tips that you didn't think you were going to get tonight. Come on, know? Matthew. Uh, don't you have a I'm, question for me? I've got a wonderful <laughs> landscape designer in the uh, in this. Thank you, Janice. Um, <laughs> very talented. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, I would like to be just like you, Janice. Oh. <laughs> I've known Janice for, is it, is it 20 years? Possibly. I yeah. took a pool class with Janice and <laughs> I learned everything I know about pools. Um, I guess a question I would have is based on all the beautiful work and we've talked about interior designers and architects. I know so many other people are involved like masons and like pool contractors and like plant inst installers and people like that. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationships you have with those people, you know, cultivating them and mm -hmm. getting them to do such great work. Well, that's a great question, Matthew. Thank you. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time. So the people I met when I, I, I knew that I wanted someone, someone said there was a great mason named Rocco. So I opened, this was the yellow pages, right? I opened, I looked at all these where there's like 40 Roccos. So I called like four of the Roccos, and the one that got out of his truck with this smile across his face like sunshine, I was like, that's my Rocco. I don't know <laughs> any of the other ones. And um, you know, we're still close. You know, we both have grandchildren now, and, um, and I learned a little Spanish for the guys, and um, you know, that's one of the most beautiful things as you get towards you know, this point and, or towards the end of your career, the friendships that you've made, the christenings and the weddings and the, the barbecues, yeah. and you, know, you go out of your way to spend time with people who build your work and, um, and personally you know, discuss things with them, bring food, bring coffee, bring Gatorade, talk to them, learn some Spanish. They will do everything in the world for you if they're not looked through, right? And my friend Linda London here will just, you know, immediately go get everybody a soda, whatever they want, talk to them in Spanish right, right away, uh, because they are so unseen, you know, they are so unseen, and they work so hard. And then the actual craftsmanship, you know, it goes up and down, right? We all know that. Sometimes you get a mason and he's amazing, and sometimes he's having a really bad time, and people come and go. Um, you know, there are certainly people at the end of a job and they never know it and they don't know why, but I'll never work with them again. I just won't ever do it again. Um, though one gentleman did come to me and he said, you know, my guys came to me in the trailer in the morning. I hadn't worked with them for about five years. They said, what did you do to Janice? <laughs> and they said, what do you, he said, what do you mean? He said, you, she doesn't give us work anymore. What did you do? What did you do to her? And he came to me and said, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> I said, if it just dawned on you, I don't know, you know, what yeah. to tell you, you know. Um, it, it's, it's, I'm not going to get into a gunfight, but I'm just not going to work with them again, right? And um, the quality, I mean, I do believe that the spirit is very important and the skills will be there if you work with them. Also, you know, I mean, it, anybody who is really willing and trying to work hard is really worth it, you know. Um, and again, like I said about the designers, I mean, the craftsmen, the masons, the excavators, they taught me everything I know. And the way I was able to teach that pool class was because I hung out with the pool crews 
and watch them. You know, I didn't know how else to learn, so I was just a construction junkie. I'd go to every job site, even if it wasn't mine. It shouldn't be Jerry Seinfeld's house, <laughs> but <laughs> if it's a job site and you it's can a, go to it's a it picture and of you her ask at, at them Jerry what they're Seinfeld doing, thing. and you want, you know, I never knew, like when I realized there are so many ways to do a fireplace, and there's so many ways to get a fireplace wrong, and there's so many ways that they build them. And, you know, I just start to study different things and talk to people. And they, I find that um, the craftsmen, far from being difficult, if you ask them to have a seat at the table and share their knowledge, um, you know, that's all any of us really want, right? We just want to, um, to share what we know and, and to be part of a team. And, um, and, and if they don't, I won't work with them again. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it has been interesting being a woman in construction. I, I don't, didn't think about it at the beginning because I had no choice. I had to make a living. I was raising kids and, um, and I had to make a living. So if it bothered me or it was uncomfortable, there was nothing I could do about it. So why spend any time on it? Right? Just why spend any time on it? I can't fix it. I can't do anything about it. It's not for me. But to, to solve. But now I do mentor women who are in construction and I mentor women who are in other areas. And um, women need a whole nother type of guidance um, than, than men do when they're getting coached. But I will say that I realize now the way they give all the young guys who work for me a hard time, I got a really fair shake. I actually was treated better then they treat my guys. It's just sport. Hmm. It's just sport when they give you a hard time. It's just sport. And they have sport with the young guys who work for me and they had sport with me to see how much you can take. That's it, that's all it is. It's just sport. And I got actually a really fair shake, I realize now. It didn't feel like it. <laughs> it didn't feel like it, but it was. It was a really fair shake. And, and they taught me everything, every single thing. Well, you have taught all of us so much tonight. Will you please join me in thanking our guest, Jennifer? Thank you. Thank you.